It's a fantasy basketball mailbag show. I'm here with my coffee. I'm here with my guest. And I'm here with my mailbag, giggity, Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore beeble on TikTok at redrock underscore beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by Price Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to pricepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use the code all lowercase locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your first listen every day. We are free and we are available on all platforms. So we are here. We are live. You guys are here ready to ask questions. And I am joined to answer those questions by a man who's going to be a recurring guest on this mailbag show throughout the season. It is the one and only Dan Titus from Yahoo Sports. Dan, welcome. What's up, Lloyd? Good to talk to you, man. It is is good. Only week week two. Things are good. Things are uh, good. Yeah, they are. There's a lot of stuff that still needs to settle, of course. That's what happens in the early part of the season. Part of, Half of our job is like just relaxing people down and just saying there are <laughs> going to be certain people aren't going to shoot 10% and they're not going to shoot 90% and they're not going to average seven blocks and they're not going to average you know, 15 and a half rebounds or maybe they do. But there's going to be some uh, stuff that does settle in over the next 70 plus games. So we're just going to get straight into this. And this is an interesting question straight away because this guy has been uh, shithouse, Dan, and it is Andrew Wiggins. Carpo Flex says, I'm desperate, and I don't know what to do with Wiggins. Doesn't seem anyone would want him in a trade. Yeah, I don't know why they would. And I am a little concerned with Wiggins at the moment because... It's not that he's undergoing a shooting slump. It's not that you know everything else just seems to be in place. He is playing like 10 fewer minutes a game. He's not generating any peripheral stats. Um, you are in the Bay Area, Dan. Like, what, what's going on? What have you heard? What's happening here with Wiggins? Um, I think the mystery is really like, is this guy, is he right? Um, yeah. You know, last season kind of ended kind of weird. You know, obviously he had the, the family issue and he missed a lot of games, but I, I feel like he's, kind of ramping up and there hasn't been any reports of a injury management plan or anything like that. But like the fact he's only getting 25 minutes a night right now, obviously only shooting 43%. um, He's struggling right now, but I think it's a good thing that everyone else around him is playing very well. Um, I think he'll be okay, but you're definitely not going to be able to come off of him yet. You're going to have to hold and then wait until, you know, he strings together a couple Maybe a few good games, and then maybe you'll have some leverage to actually get all, uh, to to be actually be able to to trade him. But yeah, I'm really disappointed in the stocks, man. He was really good at blocks last year, and you know he hasn't really done anything uh, or any, even scoring. You know he's just way off right now. But it's only been you know a handful of games, so he'll he'll get better. Yeah, I heard uh, I heard a little whisper about the an, an injury that he may be either carrying or still recovering from. No idea what it is. Uh, obviously, had the groin issue last season and then the uh, illness with his father. But I've heard there is some other injury stuff, and that is obviously impacting his um, his intensity and his playing time. I don't really... Th- I guess in category leagues, he's not usually a highly ranked player anyway. So I guess if no. he did move on, you, you could. But in a points league, he's usually a very comfortable top 80 player, and I wouldn't feel comfortable um, moving on from him in that sort of a, uh, a situation. Okay. What do you make? Well, here's another one. Wiss asks, how much of a buy low is Walker Kessler right now? Because this is also trending towards not looking great. He's had one big game. It was against Jokic. And then every other game, they just marginalize him. It's not foul trouble. It's it's matchup stuff. It, it appears they they go with the Linux. It was a blowout yesterday against the Grizzlies. They go with the Linux and Collins in that situation. And I did mention this a lot in the in the preseason that I said, Kelly Linux is really key to what they do with his shooting and passing. But I thought that might impact John Collins more than Walker Kessler. I didn't expect Kessler to be down like this. So how much of a buy low is he? I don't I don't know that he's going to be hitting some of those lofty expectations that some, including me, uh, had for him. I had him as a top 50 guy, and um, I don't think he's going to get there. The scoring hasn't really gone up. And, you know, the minutes, you know, he's barely over 22. So there's t- clearly a timeshare here. And I think 
many analysts probably underestimated how much of an impact John Collins would make. Like he's in a new scenario now and he's, he's a fixture of this rotation and I don't think his minutes are going away. So something's got to give here. And as you mentioned, Kelly Olenek isn't, is also isn't going away. So, I mean, the block potential is still obviously there, but like, unless he's getting, you know, the double double upside, I, I find it hard to believe he's going to be able to um, reach his expectation and his value um, in that ADP. Yeah. Um, in the beginning of the season. He's one of those ones that we talked about this just before we came on air about like, I was out on him, right? I had him outside the top 60, I think. Maybe he was at like 61 or, or 59 or something like that, right? Which is well below ADP. Mm -hmm. So I was correct so far on that, but I'm also still way above what his actual production was. I said, hey, he's probably, I still think he might lead the league in blocks, but I don't think so. Like he's just not going to play enough. I didn't see this happening. So you know, where you can be yep. like out on someone and still be wildly wrong, which is basically how I feel with Kessler. And it feels... Like it is a matchup thing, but also is he exhausted from playing in the World Cup? Because he didn't play in the World Cup. Like he was there, but he didn't play a huge amount. This is just the travel stuff. Are they easing it back in? I am. It is a buy low a little bit. Like if someone dropped him, Dan, I would add him. But right. like, what is a buy low in this situation? Is it? It's just throwing some of your worst players out because that's currently how he's producing. I, that's how I would view it as a buy low. I wouldn't. I wouldn't cut bait. I would add him if he was dropped, but. I think right. that some of those early expectations are probably not going to um, not going to hit. Would be my guess. Uh, I've got one more question. Do I want to? Well, not one more. The show's got, got a while to go after this. All right, uh, that's Jack. That's an easy one. Yes, Melton is worth adding. But Yuan Paula says, "Are we falling for DeAndre Hunter this time? Because we've seen it before a couple of times. He did it in a stretch about two years ago for about five games, uh, and then got hurt, and has never been seen since. And he is rolling at the moment. He was only playing thirty minutes a night." But it's always important down at this early portion of the season to see how someone is doing and not necessarily what they're doing. And there are a few... Look, you could look at that and go, well, 18-5, okay. Why not? Knock two threes, sure. 1.4 steals, oh, I guess he's a good defender. But he's also hitting 68% of his two-point shots. And I am 100% telling you that is not sticking. Like, that is dropping in a significant, significant manner. He's hitting 41% for three. Sure, he could put together a 40% three-point shooting season. There's there's no question about that. And he's never been a 1.4 steals guy. But the number one thing there is that that 55% overall field goal probably does drop seven percentage points, I would guess, 48, 47, 49. And then that obviously drops scoring. And then he becomes more into that fringy sort of territory. But you know, I do think he's worth grabbing. But this shit is just not going to hold at this level. Yeah, he's a stream for me. Ride him while he's hot. Um He's disappeared before, and I think more importantly, what does the Hawks rotation look like going mm. forward? And he's one of the names that has always been floated around by Landry, by um, Landry Fields as a potential trade candidate because his contract, him and Clint Capella, the way Sadiq Bay and Jalen Johnson are playing, it wouldn't surprise me if they're just being like, "Hey, DeAndre, go to work, build up your trade value, so we can get you out of here." Um, and obviously, that hasn't happened yet, but I, it wouldn't surprise me if it does. So, ride the heater. But don't expect him to produce like this all season. It's it's not gonna it's not gonna last long. Yeah, like that. The sixty eight percent twos is the obvious one you look at and go, well, it, it's not getting better. It's getting worse. Like it it can't get any better from where that no. sits. So that is gonna drop. So yes, no problem with having him, but just be under the expectation that this is going to fall away. Today's episode is brought to you by Price Picks. Price Picks is the largest daily fantasy sports platform independently owned in North America. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS as well. It's just you against the numbers instead of battling against thousands of different people with their pros and sharks and algorithms and spreadsheets. It's just you and player projections. And you look at the number they put out there and you go, I'll choose more or I'll choose less. Simple as that. With basketball season here, they've also got this new combo projection across football and basketball in their specials league. It's a league created specifically for combo projections, so you can get two or more players from different sports into one projection. For example, LeBron James and Travis Kelsey at 10.5 as a combo of three-pointers made and receptions. You can also play against some of Pricewick's favorite players like Meek Mill, apparently, and Andrew Schiltz. You can now find community plays under the promo tabs of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in the prize pick community each week. So go to pricepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Use the code locked on NBA. It is all in lowercase, apparently, for a first deposit match up to $100. That's pricepicks.com slash locked on NBA. And use the code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Price picks is daily fantasy sports made easy. Dan, you are 
hey, you think you'd be able to take on Meek Mill in, in price picks? <laughs> I would love to take on Meek Mill in price picks. <laughs> well, there you go. It's, it's, it's an option for you. Um, <laughs> all right. Let's, we're getting this question a lot today. Ryan Porteous, you're the lucky man who gets his name put up on the screen. Would you hold Miles Bridges if he is your worst player? We have six games to go until that 10-game fake suspension is over. <laughs> um, I feel like there's probably better waiver options available right now. Like you don't need to stash them. I don't think you need to get them yet because I feel like the situation hasn't really, it's not done yet. Right. Like he still has to, uh, he still has to attune to some other transgressions. And uh, I don't know, reading the tea leaves right now and the way Brandon Miller's playing, like why are the Charlotte Hornets going to be pressed to get him back in the lineup? I mean, they do look terrible. So they surely could use his help. But uh, I'm not rushing to get him on waivers. Like I think I'm pretty sure he'll be there, unless you're playing in like an extremely deep league and you need, you know, you're desperate for that kind of support. But generally speaking, I think you could find a better option on waivers. That's interesting. I seem to have the not seem to have. I do have the opposite opinion on this because I thought for sure that they that he just wouldn't play this season after those two different arrest warrants came out. But the Hornets, uh, with their usual, um, yeah, they're, they're they're experts with brooms and rugs, Dan. So they have mentioned nothing about this, and the longer that it goes, where there is no mention of, they haven't even said we are keeping him away from the team facility while we, while we investigate. Nothing like. That just, to me, thinks they're going to just slide him back in after the games and he will play. Um, I always have a, a pretty standing way of looking at the first couple of weeks of the season that if I am losing that first week or two, it doesn't really bother me. And I'd rather sort of just accumulate some value. And I do think that if Bridges is your worst player, like streaming in at this point in the season isn't as vitally important as it is in week 10 or week 11. Right. And I would like to hold just to see what happens because I do think that they are just going to you know slide him straight back in the Friday news dump at the end of a week and say, ah, Miles Bridges is ready to return. And then there he is. And look, you're right about the minutes because Haywood, Washington, Miller, Bridges doesn't really go that well into 96 minutes. It's going to be a little bit tough for everyone to find their playing time. But mm-hmm. look, I'm not sure who would be... Look, and it just depends. I'm not sure who would be on the waiver wire who would be... At least, you know, I don't, he's never hitting back to that top 30 numbers of, of the past, I don't no. think. But who has like maybe top 70 upside? I'd be more inclined to hold just given the trajectory of the non-news, I guess, that's coming through. Is he practicing with the Hornets right now? We saw that one video of him practicing about three or four days after the yeah. arrest news came out. We've heard nothing right. else. And I would have thought, maybe I'll hit up some Hornets people and ask, um, I would have thought that we would have heard specifically if he wasn't practicing because I, I think that they just uh, don't want to bring it up that he is. But if he wasn't there, I think we would have heard that. But that's that's a lot of assumptions from me. But that's sort of where I'm sitting um, it, with that one. I feel better about it if he was practicing. Then I'd be like, okay, yeah, they're probably going to throw him back into the lineup. But the the no news, I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what that means. So, yeah, I'd be curious to see what, what, what you hear about that. We are still up in the air, of course. James, I'm not – I'm going to just put this up because I just want to address it. Any reason you've not used an ML model to do projections? I don't exactly know what you're what you're saying there, um, but send me an email um, and let me talk. We can talk about that because I'm not I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. It's a bit too hard to get into here. But yeah, send me an email about it. You're not you're not coding your uh, projections in, in uh, Python. Uh, I, I I am not, mate. I I don't know how to use Python. I don't I don't actually do the uh, the coding on the side. I'm not a coder. That's not that's not my job. <laughs> I don't, I don't do any of that stuff. Maybe I should learn. Maybe that's next off season's thing. I know, um, right? <laughs> I've, I'm always learning new things. This year, it's learning Premiere Pro, After Effects, graphic design your, courses. That's all your, I've done. Your this. visuals are I definitely stepped it up in that. So yeah. I, I'd be curious to see you doing the Python next year. That's going to be dope. Yeah, I did that plus some uh, a bunch of like um, statistics courses this this off season, and maybe we go into coding for the next one. So we'll see how we go. Um, Dominic Ferlez. is Sohan a clear drop in twelve team category leagues? Now I, I want to address this just. Quickly before I ask you, Dan, I sometimes could be a stickler for language. So when you say a clear drop, the answer is very clearly no, right? He is not a clear drop, but could he be considered a drop? Sure. It really does depend on your situation. Like if I, if you show me a screenshot of your roster and so on, I'm like, mate, you are insane. Get this bloke off here. What are you doing? You don't know how to run a team. Like that would be a clear drop, right? I don't think that is. Like if you're holding on to Jock Landale in a 12-team league. Sorry to you, Jock. I'd say, bro, what are you doing? Like, that's a clear drop. Sohan's teetering. I, unlike a lot of other people in NBA media, don't think that the Spurs are just going to make a quick switch and put Trey Jones in over Sohan because they need a real point guard. They are experimenting, and I think this might take a while if that change happens at all. But 
He's not good generating defensive stats. He's got bad percentages. So if you wanted to drop, I don't really think there's a problem with it, Dan. He is not a hold in points leagues, that's for sure. Um, category leagues, I was intrigued by the eligibility now that he has point guard eligibility on mm-hmm. Yahoo, but uh, the, the assists aren't really, they're not jumping off the page, right? Four, four assists, six rebounds, eight points. He's expendable. Um, unless he's getting 30 minutes or something happens to Trey Jones, like that's the only reason why I would you know, keep him around. But he's only 51% rostered in Yahoo League, so I think most fantasy managers are probably starting to head to the waivers anyway. Yes, I would agree. Someone said that ML is machine learning. Of course it is. We do have... Uh, uh, oh, it's stupid. It's <laughs> it's bloody 7 o'clock in the morning here. Um, we we do, On our projections on Barcelona, so we have two ways of doing it. We have an automated um, projection system that does learn from past production from other players and that player and current production and just that. And then I have an ability to go and create manual overrides on things. And obviously with the, the machine learning stuff and the automated things, we don't make you know, snap decisions based on two games. It's like gradual adjustments that, that get pushed through with that sort of stuff. So it's a dual combination of things that we do uh, over on Basketball Monster. Um, Marcus P, this is an interesting question. I'm not really sure why these two are grouped together, but here we are. He says, do we hold on to Brandon Miller and Alec Burks? Um, I mean, yes, and also maybe, but also no. Like, uh, yeah, <laughs> like I think, again, and also guys, please give us more context as to what we're talking about here. Are you in an eight-team league, a 16-team league? We don't know. But let's just talk about these two. Alec Burks was that weird shock withdrawal yesterday that we didn't really know about. Dan, I think he's totally okay as a streamer, but not someone I have any interest in you know, planting my flag on being a hold. Whereas Miller, we saw some of the concerns in the game yesterday with that aforementioned forward mix of that, like if some other guy has got it going and they're not going to run small, the, the minutes just aren't going to be there. I think he played like 10 minutes in the first half or something. So I would hold Miller. Burks is okay, but there is some worry about how Miller gets deployed on a nightly basis. Yeah, I would agree. Alec Burks is just a yearly streamer. He gets those opportunities to hop into the starting lineup here and there. The Killian Hayes, Jaden Ivey rotation is kind of fluid right now. So maybe Alec Burks actually maintains some foothold in that rotation, like over them. But um, I would just again, it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a heat rider pretty much. But um, Brandon Miller, I've come around on. I was low on him in the beginning of the season, mm. had him low in my rankings. I love the way that he's playing. He's playing with confidence way better than what we saw in the preseason, or excuse me, in summer league. Um, he's playing defense, and he's actually a sneaky rebounder. He's getting like two offensive rebounds a game. I don't know if that's going to stick. Obviously not. But it's the log jam that I'm concerned about. So I think it's worth holding just given what he's shown from an efficiency standpoint and what he's given in, in across categories. Um, and even, I mean, he's averaging almost like, I think he's like top five in points off the bench right now, even with last, last night's dud. So, um, I think there's, there's some upside here with, with Brandon Miller. There is, but then we, it ties us back into the bridges thing where there's upside, but and, then yeah. if, if you add another guy right. who might get 30 minutes into the mix, it's like, how does it all work out? You know, yeah. JT Thor can be removed from the rotation, but this is the worry we all had with Miller, especially early on before the bridges, um, extra incident occurred. Is that like, will Steve Clifford prioritize a young guy when there are three proven older players who play at the same positions than him. And that that does, I think, become somewhat of a concern. But yes, we definitely yeah. we definitely hold him. Um, interesting, there's two questions in a row there about Brandon Miller in the chat. We don't need to get to both of those. Today's episode is also brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. 150 bucks if your team wins on the money line. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's never been a better time to get in on the action and all those bonus bets dollars that you get when you place those money line bets. And I would suggest maybe placing those money line bets against the Wizards. And that might be a good way to get $150 in bonus bets. You can use that on spreads and player props and futures and... Uh, prop player, I said player props already, totals, over-unders, whatever it is you want, MVP odds on the MVP. Uh, hey, there's a, maybe you want to place a bet on the Bucks not to make the playoffs. Things aren't uh, things aren't going particularly swimmingly over there in Milwaukee. So go to fanjul.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. Fanjul is an official partner of the NFL. And don't forget to gamble responsibly. That'll bring us back in here, Dan. We're going to have a chat about some more questions that people have. Let's see what we've got. All right, let's do, let's do this one. Um, Jordan Poole. What are our thoughts on Jordan Poole's production? 
Should I be worried and consider trading? Well, first of all, Clutch, I'm glad you asked that because it brings up an important point. Like, why? You cannot possibly consider trading a guy when his value is as low as it could possibly ever be. Like, you will get nothing back. Yes, it is frustrating. But as we will always say, let's go and have a look at the numbers and see what makes sense here. Jordan Poole is currently playing 27 minutes, and I know the Wizards are getting killed every night, but I really don't think he's going to stick at 27 a night. He's shooting under 39% from the field, which includes 24% from three. And no matter what you think of Jordan Poole as a player, no matter what you think of Jordan Poole as a shooter, I hereby sit on this chair, Dan, and I tell you, solemnly, he will not be a 24% three-point shooter. This will not happen. He won't do that. He also probably won't average two and a half assists per game. Like these things just won't stick at these levels. So if you have him now, everyone's looking at it. Everyone's laughing at him. Everyone's clowning on the guy. You're getting nothing back in a trade. Am I a little worried that they just get their asses kicked every game and they just decide they're not going to play him at all, which is weird considering he is the guy. Honestly, he's what they got back in the Bradley Beal trade. Like that's a little concerning, yeah? Like that they just won't even give him any minutes at all. But there are certain things here that are 100% going to improve. And he's still averaging 17 points a game, despite being absolutely dreadful at the moment. So yeah, should you trade him? Uh, no. Um, yeah, should you be worried? A little bit with the minutes, but like it, it's, I, I find it hard to believe it gets worse from here. Yeah, I, I mean, should you consider trading him in a 10-team league Points league, absolutely not. Um, he's still getting up 16 shots per game in 27 minutes. Once that goes over 30, like he's going to be getting over 20 shots. He's going to regress. He's going to shoot over well over 40% from the field. As you said, the three-pointers will also come with that. Um, I'm actually surprised he's not getting to the line more. He's only attempted three, uh, about four free throws a game. Um, so I think that's all going to change. And in a points league, you're not hurt by his inefficiency. So I would absolutely not be looking to trade – Jordan Poole in a points league. Um, he's only going to get better. So, yeah, yep. ride the way. Uh, yep. Just hold on to him. Look, and we can talk about the Wizards being terrible, and they are. They won't get beaten by 20 points every single night. They won't even get beaten by 20 points every second night. Like, that is, that's just very hard to do. And I think part of what we've seen in the last couple of games with the Wizards is as weird as it sounds. Like, there's no Daniel Gafford. So that means they've got... I was going to say Daniel Gafford. Absolutely <laughs> nobody. And he's not a great player, but there is nobody <laughs> to provide any rim defense whatsoever. So it's just... Layup line after layup line after layup line. And that enables these big blowouts. And Gafford isn't the solution to everything. But when your team is as poorly constructed as this, he sort of is. Like, he sort of is that key part. And we said this all off season that he is their only center. He is their only player who can play that position. And that means he's going to have to play quite a bit. And now he's hurt. So he can't. And they're getting cooked repeatedly. It is weird to see guys like Denny Avdia take more shots than Jordan Poole in the game. Like, I won't lie about that. But yeah, I do think that he's going to improve. I just didn't expect this level of blowouts. There is an interesting question here from Jacob Henry. He says, do you think Scoot retains his 30 plus minute role if he doesn't improve much by the time Simons is back? And I would be absolutely stunned, Dan, if he didn't. This is not about winning for this season. This is about what is Scoot and Shaden going to do. And as much as Anthony Simons might have been considered the man for this season, I, I'm telling you, he is not considered a part of their future as their number one guy. I'm not saying that Simons is going to lose his role. He's not. But Scoot and Shaden, that is what this season, internally, that is what this season is about. Is it about Scoot and Shaden, what they can do. And no matter how much Scoot struggles, he's not getting benched or minutes drop down to mid-20s because as a rookie point guard, he's struggling to figure it out on the second worst team in the NBA. I just, if that happened, uh, I would be firing Chauncey Billups immediately, but I'm pretty sure that Chauncey Billups and Joe Cronin are, uh, yeah, they're having chats about this and there's just no, it's just not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. Um, I feel like Scoot Henderson probably has the third or fourth best security of a rookie. You know, you got Wemby, you mm -hmm. got Chet. Mm-hmm. Probably a Sar Thompson, and then I would say Scoot. Like they're not leaving the starting lineup. The reason I'm concerned about Scoot is that it's really a shot selection. He's not known as a three point shooter, but yet half of his shots are coming from beyond the arc. So I'm assuming at some point he's going to figure out, like, hey, I should probably get to my mid range more, utilize my athleticism, get to the rim, draw more fouls. He's going to be better. I understand if you want to drop him in like a points league. Um, but his minutes are safe. So, like, if you're in a 12-team league or, or deeper than that, I, I just have to hold and, and weather the storm here. He's going to be better, but like all rookie guards, they're going to struggle with efficiency, turnovers, and kind of acclimate to the game. And he, remember, he's super young. Like, Kyrie Irving didn't play well his first four games in the league either. So, there, yeah. there's precedence here. you got to wait it out. 
absolutely. You just you just you are have to wait. The ankle injury does complicate it a little bit, but we we worry can worry about production and all that sort of stuff. But the role, I'm not really concerned about. No. Luke says you didn't talk about Benedict Matherin in the recap last night, yeah, because that game was a 51 point like destruction. It's really <laughs> hard to have discussed the minutes yeah. when Nucky's playing 17 minutes and Bruce Brown's playing that and Halliburton was out. But to be fair, Matherin has not played particularly well. But do you hold on to him in a 12 team points league, ESPN? Yes, I think you do. It's really like for these sort of guys who I think you feel comfortable with a secure role, and you know, that is might take a little bit of time. Like we are nine days into the season, I'm not going to just cut bait. Like a guy that I cut bait on, like Josh Hart. Like we needed to see how the minutes would go, and then he was playing 24. And I'm like, okay, I'll see you later. Like that's if that comes back, the upside's not really there. I don't see that security in role. That's fine. A guy like Matherin, who's had some poor games, but I feel really good that he's going to be playing solid minutes. But if we assess this at Thanksgiving or you know the 20th of November, say, and it's still the same stuff as last season, inefficient points with nothing else, and he starts getting his minutes pushed back, then I would consider moving on. But at this point, nine days in, no, I'm just going to ride it out. Like this is what I talk about when I say like just you got to be okay taking an L in week one and week two and just let some stuff settle in because a lot of these guys are rusty, new systems, new teammates variance kills and variance is huge and we don't think about it enough even though I talk about it every single day we don't think about it enough so I wouldn't yeah you can always be like oh this is yuck but I wouldn't be making rash moves with it I'd say yeah I feel like we need to talk about just benching guys because most of these players on a given week you might be having to bench them on a Monday Wednesday big slate type of thing anyway you don't have to play your guys it doesn't mean you have to drop them either um Ben Matherin dropped 16 and a half points off the bench last year um He's going to score more. And like he hasn't been going to the line. He got to the line like seven times a game last year. He's going to fall. He's going to figure it out. And it seems like Carlisle's still kind of playing with the rotations as well. There's some fluidity in that power forward situation. Tyrese Halliburton's already missing games. Give this some time to kind of feel itself out. And the Pacers were playing well before, you know, last night's blowout. So um, I'm holding on to Matherin wherever I have him, especially in the 12 team league. Like he's too good for him to be out on waivers. Yep, uh, I agree. That's exactly what I would be doing there. Let's go back. We're just talking Hornets the whole time here because there is some questions. Dre for fun says, what's your level of worry about LaMelo? Is it an overreaction to say he has the same issue that Zion did with not taking injury recovery seriously or just a small sample size slow start? Is it an overreaction? Yes. I did do some digging on this to figure out what's going on because yesterday in the first half, I go, what's going on this guy? What's actually happening here? So I checked in with it and I found out and then obviously as the second half played, it looked much better. But the thing was that we were... I don't know how to put this kindly. We were lied to by Mitch Kupchak when he said that Lila Mello is fine and ready to go because a couple of days ago, Steve Clifford came out and said, yeah, like he wasn't actually able to do full contact until October. I went, oh, what? Like, okay, that would have been been sick to know that when your GM lied to us a month earlier and told us, no, he's ready to go. Everything's fine. He's been doing everything. uh, When that was just a clear lie. So we didn't know that at the time. And Clifford, just like two days ago, I think it was, said, no, no, he couldn't do full contact until October after his ankle surgery again. Would have been awesome to have known that. So that is what it is. It's knocking off rust. That is why he's got this soft sort of minutes limit of 31, 32. And again, is he in a situation where is it's what he's doing going to stick at this poor level? Like I highly doubt it. He is shooting 30.5%. And if there's one thing, you know, nobody does that. He's shooting 26 from the three. He's shooting 34 from two. He's still averaging eight assists a game, 1.5 steals, five rebounds and two threes. He's playing 30 minutes. Like this is to me, Dan It is an absolute classic, classic buy low. Cause there are the very clear indicators of it. It has to get better. Plus that, you know, that little nugget of like, nah, actually wasn't healthy three weeks ago. Yeah, I think the fact that it came out, you know, just last week that this guy's on a mince restriction, it just sucks for fantasy purposes. Like, Mm. I probably would have dropped him down a few notches. That being said, it's an overreaction. He's absolutely a buy low, similar to Paolo Bancaro and the way that he started. You know, this guy averaged 20 points and seven rebounds last year. He'll figure it out. And you just got to give a little bit more time to figure this out. If, if people are panicking on LaMelo Ball, scoop in on that immediately because that's, uh, you know, that's a guy that can potentially give you uh, 20 points with nine dimes and like seven rebounds. So I'll take that any day of the week. The ankle surgery thing is interesting because Julius Randle also had off-season ankle surgery and he looks dreadful too. Terrible. And he yeah. cannot get anything to fall and it will improve, but... 
that has obviously slowed both of those guys coming into the season. And we tried to do our due diligence to find out where those guys were at and everything was like, oh, they're okay. Like they had their surgery, they're ready to go. But you always got to have that in your head. Like, okay, they did have surgery. They couldn't do everything. So it's going to take... Yeah, their off season was basically everyone else's preseason. So their start of their regular season becomes a little bit of their preseason as they work back in. So that is uh, yeah something to just keep in mind. I think maybe even more for future seasons um, as well. Dan, we are what's the time? Yep, we are we are done. We are out of time here. So thank you again for your first uh, of many recurring appearances on the weekly mailbag show. Tell people what uh, what have you got coming out over at uh, Yahoo Sports. Yeah, so make sure you tune in to the Roto Ball, Roto Ball, Roto Ball, <laughs> Roto World Basketball Show on uh, NBC, where me, Von Dalzell, and, and Raphael Johnson break down fantasy hoops each week. And uh, my article is coming out every day on Yahoo Sports. So make sure you download the Yahoo Fantasy app, play fantasy basketball. If you haven't signed up for a team, you can still do so. Join a public league or a private league. Um, you might see me in there. So um, yeah, man. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Dan Titus or X, whatever it's called now. And I uh, appreciate you for having me, Josh. Not a problem. I think Dan, you're going to be back on again next week as well to do these. Um, and then, yeah, we will, uh, we'll see you next time, Dan. Thank you. Yes, sir. Guys, follow this podcast, Apple podcast, Google podcast, Stitcher, not Stitcher, just Spotify, Odyssey, and on YouTube. Thumb it up. Leave your comments down below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. <laughs>